give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength, seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God, his judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When they were but few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. He called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons till what he foretold came to pass, till the word of the Lord proved him true. The king sent and released him. The, rulers, the ruler of peoples set him free. He made him master of his household, ruler o over all he possessed, to instruct his princes as he pleased and teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel entered Egypt. Jacob resided as a foreigner in the land of Ham. The Lord made his people very fruitful. He made them too numerous for their foes, whose hearts he turned to hate his people, to conspire against his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed his signs among them, his wonders in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark, for had they not rebelled against his words? He turned their waters into blood, causing their fish to die. Their land teemed with frogs, which went up into the bedrooms of their rulers. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He turned their rain into hail, with lightning throughout their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees, and shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came, grasshoppers without number. They ate up every green thing in their land, ate up the produce of their soil. Then he struck down all the firstborn in their land, the firstfruits of all their manhood. He brought out Israel laden with silver and gold, and from among the tribes no one faltered. Egypt was glad when they left, because dread of Israel had fallen on them. He spread out a cloud as a covering, and a fire to give light at night. They asked, and he brought them quail. He fed them well with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed like a river in the desert. For he remembered his holy promise, given to his servant Abraham. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they fell heir to what others had toiled for, that they might keep his precepts and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Morning, everyone. Hello. I may have a couple of stories coming up on the screen that you were talking about earlier on. I love a good timeline. I like kind of maps and that kind of stuff. Um, they help you to see the big picture of the story, which is good, especially if there's lots of little stories that kind of all add up to a big story. So time is really helpful for that. Help you to see the plan all along. So for example, Jurassic Park. Oh yeah. Starts on the side, this side here. They bought an island, okay. Made some dinosaurs, okay. It all went wrong. Yeah, okay. And then they tried to do it again. <laughs> and you can see all the way through from 1993 was the first one, not quite 78. All the way through to all how all the movies kind of come through right to the end. Um, and actually there are still viewings of the sixth installment, <laughs> Jurassic World Dominion, this evening. So if you want to watch the last one, then you can still do it even this evening. And you can see how it all kind of fits together over 
nearly 30 years. Or here's one that gets a little bit more complicated. Whew. This one is 10 years of Marvel movies, all adding up to the greatest and biggest movie of all time, Avengers Endgame, yeah. And this doesn't even talk about the time travel that starts a new timeline. There's like a timeline within time, yeah. But it helps you to try and figure out the overall story and how we got to the end of it. And especially thinking about the guys who made these movies, to think about how they planned, maybe they, I think they planned, all the way from the, ten, the first movie over here for 10 years, all the way up to there, planned that they would all culminate in one big story at the end. So this morning, we're going to be thinking a little bit about the timeline that we saw in Psalm 105, and how actually there is a big plan through all of that. And actually, it wasn't imaginary dinosaurs or people with superpowers. It was reality. We're going to see how David was calling God's people to worship because of it. We're going to explore what the timeline was and kind of do a bit of a recap for that. And we're going to see how all of it can help us personally today to trust God and to praise him more. So first, we've got David's call to worship. If you read through the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles, you can do that later on if you'd like to, um, in the Bible, they tell the narrative of God's people up to the point of David, and they kind of carry that on in a bit more detail. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we see David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and he is super excited. He does a dance. People think it's a bit crazy because he's dancing, but it's fine if you like to dance or not. But the point is, the Ark of the Covenant was a big thing for the Israelites. The Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God. So in the Ark were the stone tank banners, all sorts of things. It represented the presence of God. And this was the presence of God finally coming into the place where God's people were. This is why David was so excited. And actually, in 1 Chronicles 16, the words of Psalm 105 are replicated. So we can kind of see where this psalm came, came in the kind of story of um, of God's people. It was David who, who was writing it and he was telling the people to praise God because the Ark of the Covenant had come to Jerusalem. So we can see the few things here in the first part of the, of the psalm. He said to give praise to God. That's quite a thing that we often see. What does it really mean? Well, it means in the verses 1 to 3, he kind of explains it a little bit more. Like Psalms 103 and 104 we had and actually 106 next week. They all start with praise the Lord. What does that really mean? David says that we are to extol God, that means to give him the highest honor, to put him number one before all things. But to thank him, so we have to think about things that, that, that are good, and to thank God, acknowledge that he is the one who gives it to us. And we're to make music to God. And I quite like um, that he calls out the band in uh, 1 Chronicles 16. He tells who are the people to make the music. So it's like you, meant, you know, like in a big band, and it's Mark on the Cajon, that kind of stuff. He says, it's Zechariah, Jaziel, Shemai Maroth, Jehiel, Mattiah, Eliab, Benaniah, Obed-Edom, and Jael on the lyres and harps. And Asaph is to go on the cymbals. And Benaiah and Jehaziel on the trumpets. These are the, guy, these are the guys who are following David, doing his dancing into Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant. They're to make music. That was the main part of how we can praise God. Verse 1, 2, and, th one, two and 5 say to declare... Sorry, to declare to others what God has done. I kind of see this as a little bit like Old Testament evangelism. This is kind of what we're called to do as well. So it's not only to study and to learn about God. Um, coming to church on a Sunday is a great way. Home groups in the week, to do that kind of stuff. But it's to tell others about him. And to tell each other about him as well. And this is especially about other people. We'll get onto that later on. But it could be about what we know from, of God through the scriptures that's what he's done but it could also be what he's done in our lives as well if something's happened that's great in your life tell others about it and acknowledge that god is the one who's done that first one or two talk about the nations as well to spread god's name to the nations so uh, israel were, was god's nation they were god's chosen people but it wasn't only to those people and in the bible we get examples all the time of people who aren't in israel ethnically who become part of um of god's people and who praise him and who follow him so they weren't to keep god to themselves but they were to sh tell others and to share his name spread his name to other people around 
And this is kind of a little bit about how God calls us in the Great Commission as well. Don't just keep uh, your faith to yourself. Don't just keep God to yourself. It's not a private thing. Tell others so they can come and be brought in to our, our community. Verse 4 is a really key one. It's to rely on God. Rely on God for strength especially. This is a great way to praise God. It doesn't seem like it. It's not like a thing. It's not like a song. That's quite an expressive way. But to rely on God for strength is to acknowledge that we need God for strength. Exactly what Dan was saying earlier on. We need God for strength. And maybe we can do things by ourselves, but that's only because God has given it to us. And those times when we can't do things by ourselves, we need God for strength. So to ask him for that, to seek his face, is a way to praise him, to say, you're the one who gives me strength, God. I need it. Please give it to me. That is a way to praise him. And to seek his face. This is to know him, to make an effort to get to know him better, to know more of him. That could be in reading the word. It could be in prayer. It could be speaking with each other, going to church on a Sunday, home groups. These are ways that we can seek God's face to, um, to know him better and to see who he is. And again, it's a great way to praise God because God wants to, to know us. He wants us to know him as well. So it's going to do that. It's praise to him and it pleases him too. And finally, in verse 5, remember all the things that he has done. This isn't just us Bible memorizing, which is a good thing to do, or trying not to forget all the stuff. I remember when I was a kid, I had to remember all the books of the Bible in order, and I got five pounds if I managed to recite them afterwards. That's not just to do that, although these are good things. But this remember is to recall to mind, to intentionally make an effort to remember what God has done, to recall what that is. It's kind of like in November when we remember those who died in the war. It's not that it's just that we don't forget. It's that we intentionally remember who they were, what they did. And verse 8 is the key verse in this psalm to um, give praise to God. It gives us the reason to, pray, to praise God. It says that we are to remember his covenant forever. Sorry, let me start again. It says that he remembers his covenant forever. He remembers the promise that he has made for a thousand generations. This tells us that God is to be praised, all those things that we just spoke about in those first verses, because he remembers his covenant and he is faithful to what he promises. We praise God because he remembers his covenant. He is faithful to what he promises. The eternal God, the one who made everything, who without, without him nothing exists, he is to be praised, first of all, because he made a covenant with us, Weak humans who were created, undeserving, often in rebellion, going off on our own. He came down to us to make a covenant, to make a promise, to engage with us, to have a relationship with us. There's a guy with quite a cool name, Wolfgang Musculus. Yeah. He was um, a 16th century theologian. He said, We must ponder with pious wonder how God has deigned to enter into a covenant with man, the immortal with the mortal, the most powerful with the weakest, the most just with the most unjust, the richest with the poorest, the most blessed with the most wretched. That God comes down to us in covenant, first of all, is a great way, a great reason to give him praise. But we should also praise him for his goodness in what he promises in these covenants to his people. He promises that they would be his people, they would be in his place, with him, and if they live under his rule, they'll know his blessing. They'll know what is made for what we were made for, made to do. What is the what is the way to be truly human? We're to praise him because he's faithful to his promises. He made those promises, and he can be relied on to bring them to pass, to keep them. So, how do we know this? I mean, that's very well for me to say and for all of us to say. But how do we know that God will keep his promises that he's made to us? Well, we know for the same reason that the sun is going to rise tomorrow morning. We know that. We know it for the same reason that if we kick a ball in the air, that it's going to come down again. We know it for the same reason that if you make an animal park with dinosaurs, it's going to go wrong. Or if you hit Captain America, he's going to get back up again, because he can do it all day. We know these things because it's happened before. When we see something that's happened before, we can trust that it's going to happen again. So the timeline is one of these ways that we can do so. This is why um, Psalm 8 is here. It's not only the reason to praise, but it's the beginning of the timeline that is in this psalm. 
Uh, in verse 5, you might remember, it says, remember the miracles and the wonders and the judgments that he's made. So the timeline is here to help us to do that, to tell us what those ones are. Here we go. Spend a bit of time doing this. I've got an interactive timeline. I told you about timelines. So this is my, my own little timeline from what's in Psalm 105. Um, I wanted to put these in, and there's some dates as well, to try and remind us that these are true events, they're historical events. They really did happen. Uh, they weren't in movies or in books or comics. And there's not only the Bible to learn these things from, but actually archaeological evidence proves them as well. And sometimes say, ah, but what about this one? And usually when people bring up one of those, somehow we find some sort of tablet or something in archaeology that teaches us those things. I said that the exact dates are quite contested. There's different ideas. These are the ones that I, I stand on, um, but you can do more study and research if you like. Each time that one of these bits comes up, we're going to see that God has kept his promise to Abraham. So bear with me. Let's see if it works. Okay. So God made a covenant with Abraham. You can see this in Genesis chapter 12, if you want to later on. Ultimately, um, it's mentioned in Psalm 105 that he will inherit the land of Canaan. The promise also included lots of other things, that Abraham's family would grow, and they would be as vast as the stars are in the sky. And bearing in mind, Abraham is about 100 years old on his way there. This is quite a big promise that God would do. So the question then through the whole of the Old Testament up to when David is there is, well, is God going to keep his promise? Is God going to make his people in his place as vast as the stars with his blessing? That's what the question is that's going to go on. Abraham does have a child that you might know um, with his wife, Sarah, which is what God promised, called Isaac. And the family does grow and it does reach Canaan, which is the place that God told, uh, promised Abraham that he would inherit. And God protects them all the way. Even though they make lots of mistakes and probably some terrible decisions, God protected them all the way, and he was faithful. He was faithful to his promise. But they aren't quite as vast as the stars in the sky yet, so that part hasn't quite been done yet. They've inherited the land, but there's still parts that they're waiting on. Here we go. Psalm six, uh, verse 16 talks about this famine on the land, but God sends Joseph ahead. Joseph kind of comes out of everywhere. You might know the story of Joseph from the Bible if you've read um, those chapters. Genesis 37 to 50 is quite a lot there. You might know him from the musical that a lot of people might know about Joseph and his colorful coat. He has some dreams that his brothers uh, and his family are going to bow down to him one day. And as you can imagine, if you've got brothers and sisters, if you said, I'm going to be better than you, they won't like it. And that is definitely true for Joseph. They sell him into slavery. They tell his father that he's died and his father is distraught, and they think, great, we've got rid of him. Now, he's not the favorite anymore because he's gone. He ends up in Egypt, and he ends up in prison. So Psalm 105 talks about his feet in shackles and his neck in iron. And he's actually in that prison for 22 years. So you imagine Joseph thinking, is God going to be faithful to his promise? Well, he isn't at the moment. I'm kind of in jail, and everyone thinks I'm dead. But he trusted God, even through all of those years, more than two decades of being in prison, feeling abandoned, that God was going to keep him safe and deliver him. And yes, he was eventually released by Pharaoh. Uh, Joseph, has, Joseph is, has a gift from God to be able to interpret dreams, and all that comes into that story. And he's in fact made a ruler in Egypt. So from being sold as a slave in prison, Joseph is now a ruler in Egypt, and he's able to actually provide for God's people in that place where the famine was. He, he uh, kind of plans for uh, providing food. He project manages the whole thing. His brothers and his father come back, come over to Egypt, and he welcomes back, them back in. There's kind of two and throw in there. You can read it in Genesis again. And now God's, God has been faithful to his promise because he is pr providing for the family, for Jacob and Joseph, Jacob's the father, Joseph and his brothers. He's providing for them, even though there's a massive famine. They're not going to die out. They're going to be provided for. So God is being faithful to his promise, and his people provided for. Verses 23-27, we see about Joseph's father, and his, who was called Israel, Jacob and Israel. They move to Egypt. They're cared for by Joseph, and their numbers grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and they get so massive. But years later, Joseph and his family are forgotten about. His descendants are huge, but the Egyptians are not very happy. And the Egyptian uh, rulers are worried about that these guys are going to start taking over. So they turn against his people. But you might notice in Psalm 105, it says that God turned Egypt against his people. 
So that bit seems a little bit strange. Why is God the one turning the Egyptians against his people? There's not a huge amount of time to go into it now. We can talk about it later if you want over picnic time. But what we can learn from this is two things. A, God is in control of all things. Even though it seemed like the Israelites were being oppressed and it was terrible, God is in control. It's not that he's surprised by any of this. Nothing happens apart from his power and his plan. And secondly, we can see that even when things seem bad in all sorts of ways, you just don't know what God is doing. It says that he brought Moses, Moses and Aaron up to do his work and eventually, if you know the story, to tell Pharaoh to let his people go out of Egypt and to go back into the land that he promised to Abraham all those years ago. So the vastness of the promise, all the people, there's so many people that even Egypt, the great power of the world, is worried and is scared. So God is being faithful to his promise uh, that he told to Abraham all those years ago. Ten plays in Exodus. So you'll notice that the ten plays, you might have recognized some of those in Psalm 105 when, when Simon and Alice were reading through them. There's eight of the ten plagues here that are mentioned here in the kind of um, summary that David gives. They were brought down upon Egypt by God to when, as Moses was confronting Pharaoh, let my people go, no plague. That kind of thing happened over and over again. You may know the story from uh, the Bible. It's in Exodus chapter 7 to 14. Or there's the great animated movie, Prince of Egypt. You can watch that one later on. Don't watch the new one that was a bit rubbish. That was, that, don't watch that one. It talks about darkness, water into blood, the river Nile, the frogs, the flies, the gnats, the hail and thunder, the locusts, which were in the new Jurassic Park movie. That's another thing. And the death of the firstborn. And that's the one that eventually uh, lets the people go. They end up leaving Egypt. And not only do they just leave Egypt with their freedom, but as I mentioned in Psalm, they leave with silver and gold. And there's a, there's a very strange bit in the, in the story in Exodus, but the Egyptians, uh, the Israelites take the, the silver and gold from all the Egyptians and they go off. So now they even have this material blessing and they're going back to their promised land that God originally promised Abraham all those years ago. But verses 39 to 41 talk about the kind of on the way there. It talks about the wilderness. This is one of my favorite bits, actually, in, in the Old Testament, maybe even in the Bible. The people are walking in the wilderness, but they're led by the very presence of God. So this is kind of pointing towards the ark. God comes in a, a pillar of fire during the night so they can see where they go in. He comes in a pillar of cloud and smoke during the day. And God is literally leading the people there. But it's not enough for the Israelites. They're hungry, so God sends manna, which is heavenly bread, that just falls upon the ground six, six days of the week. They go out and they collect it, and they have all they need. Still not happy, they're thirsty, so God enables water to come out of the rock. I mean, in the middle of the desert, a big rock, they're thirsty, water pours out. This is amazing, some of those miracles and wonders that we were talking about before. So God is providing for them and keeping them safe on the way back to the land they inherit. He's faithful to his promise. And after 40 years... There we go. 40 years. The people eventually arrive back in the promised land. They, no long, they not only have their land, but they are vast in number, just as that original covenant with Abraham was. The promise was being fulfilled. God's people were in his place. And the reason for all this, you might see in the last verse, was so that they would live under his rule. They would obey his precepts, his commands. The commands that he gave to Moses on the way there through the wilderness. So they would reflect God's character as they followed these commands. And therefore, they would enjoy his blessing even further. So God is faithful to his promise. We can remember from all this that God's salvation plan and his covenant promises can't be broken. They can't. Everything that happened, as we saw, was under God's control. He was providing. He was organizing and orchestrating all of it. He was doing all the planning through the whole timeline, the good times and the bad times. God was in control to get to this point that we got to at the end. So Joseph put it well, as Richie was saying, as we sang, he put it well that after the decades of betrayal from his family, abuse from the Egyptians where he was, being left in prison for 22 years, he meets his brothers again and he says in Genesis chapter 50, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And you might say in the example of Joseph, if it wasn't for that slave, being sold into slavery in the first place, the God's people would not be cared for in the end by Joseph as ruler of Egypt. All these things kind of come into place. If God is sovereign, if he's in control, he could keep his promises and he could be trusted for everything. There's so many reasons for the Israelites here. If you think about David writing this psalm for the people as they are came into Jerusalem, so many reasons for them to praise him. His very presence was going to be with his people in the ark. That's why they were writing this whole psalm. And he had been faithful to his promise all the time in the past, and he will be in the future. So if you're a Christian today, then you can join in this, in this celebration. As Richard was saying, this is the same God that we serve today. The same God that did all these things those thousands of years ago. And in Galatians in the New Testament, Paul says that we are children of Abraham as well, by faith. So actually we're part of this story spiritually going forwards. This is our story as well. But maybe you're thinking, oh, that's all right, but I don't really relate to any of these stories. It's not really me. I wasn't there. This wasn't anything that's happening really to me. They're nice Bible stories, but not really relevant for me. So if that is you, or if it's not, that's fine. One thing at least we can remember from all of this is that God is faithful. He promised, and he kept his promises, and he will in the future. But there's something very personal and very relevant today that we can still take if you're one of God's people. Because we have a new and a better covenant that we can trust God for. The Bible calls it the new covenant, very helpfully. A while after David wrote this psalm, uh, back in the day, the prophet Jeremiah spoke the word of God to the people of God about a new covenant. So you can read this in the book of Jeremiah in the Bible, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Oh, yep, there you go. Um, He says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. This is the new covenant. Here are three things that the New Covenant promises uh, that Jeremiah told us. These things that we can trust God to, to keep in his promise to us even today. So, he'll put his law on our minds and our hearts. This is to say they will no longer be slaves to sin, will no longer be sin that controls us to, to pull us away from God. But we, with God's help by his Spirit, will be able to fight sin truly fight sin and live for him. We'll be able to be under his rule and know his blessing. As I said before, God's law is the best way for us to live, the way that we were made to live, and it's how we can be truly human. So this is a good thing for us. And God promises to help us, to enable us to live this way. God says that he will be our God and we will be his people. We'll be in right relationship with him. We'll no longer be enemies of God as we were before, as we rebelled against him, but he will be our God. We will have a right relationship with him, one that brings us joy, that brings God joy, and brings us life everlasting. And the reason all these things can happen is because our sins will be forgiven and they'll be remembered no more. Our sins, our rebellion against God, deserves punishment. God is just. His judgments are seen across the world. God needs to deal with sin. But he promises that he will deal with our sin. And the consequences of our sin will be removed from us. That was Psalm 103 a few weeks ago. As far as the east is from the west, so far will our sins be removed from us. And that sin is putting a barrier between us and God. Between us, the ones who are made by God, the one who made us, who gives us purpose, who loves us. And that barrier will be gone. But this covenant isn't just something God has promised that we have to try and trust in and wait every day. Hopefully he'll do it. Hopefully he'll do it because... He's done it. 
He sent his son, Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, you can see on the screen, says, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. It's Jesus' perfect life and his innocent death, his victorious resurrection, and his glorious ascension to heaven that keeps the promises of the new covenant. He's now sent the Spirit to work in our minds and our hearts so we can know the law of God and to keep it. When he died, the Bible says that the curse of the temple was torn in two. That was a physical barrier to remind the Israelites there's a barrier between you and God that needs to be dealt with. That was ripped down as Jesus died so we can have right relationship with him. And the agony of the cross as Jesus died as an innocent man and the, um, the forsaking of the eternal father on the, on the eternal son that Jesus experienced, that paid the infinite price for the sins of all of God's people. The punishment that each of my sins deserved, each of your sins deserved, when we put our trust in Jesus, has been paid for in that moment. That's why at the Last Supper before Jesus died, he said that the wine representing his blood the life that drains out of him as he died was the new covenant. He died as a ransom to set us free from our sins and to give us the promised eternal inheritance. So Abraham was promised an inheritance. Remember the land of Canaan. But our inheritance is not just a land that will one day go. It's eternal and it's everlasting. It's a new creation, not this creation, it's free from sin and suffering, not one where we have to endure it. And it's with God himself. Another psalm says, it's joy everlasting and it's pleasures forevermore. So God was faithful to his promise to Abraham, as we saw in this timeline, but he will also be faithful to his promise to us too. So what next? If you're not a Christian today, if you're not quite made that decision to hear what God is calling you to do, even today, to go to him, to trust in him, in all that he's promised, then do it. You're here today. You're exactly where God wants you to be. He wants you to come to him. If you're not sure what that quite means, then come and talk to me afterwards. Talk to Richard. Talk to whoever you're here with. We'll love to talk you through it. And if you are a Christian, then let this psalm be a reminder to you of the new covenant and God's faithfulness to do it that we can trust in. You can follow the, those first verses of Psalm 105. So praise and remember all that God has done for us. Think about what we know in the scriptures, about God in the Old Testament, about Jesus in the New Testament. Think about his death in your place, his resurrection that points us towards what we will experience. Think about uh, his ascension, which means that he is alive today, praying for us. Remember what God has done in your life. And tell others about it. Talk to others about it. Prayers that have been answered, supernatural deliverance. Let's tell each other about it. There are signs that you can trust God's faithfulness. And tell others about him. Don't just keep it here today and then go off and then wait until next Sunday and then talk about it again. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends and your family. People at work, in school, university, on your street. God has an amazing salvation plan and he wants people to be involved in it, in his family, in the church. So tell others about it. And rely on him. Rely on him for strength. Seek his face. When things are hard, when things are good, make an effort to know him. Make an effort to ask him for strength, to go to him, to rely on him for that. He loves it when you do, because he wants to provide it for you. So do that. It will please him. It will please you. And then it will praise him as we should. In good times and bad, remember that God remembers his covenant. God has promised and he'll be faithful to do it. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you for your faithfulness, for your wonderful acts, for your promises to us. Praise you that you are the covenant God. Thank you that we can see how you have been faithful to your promises in the past, and when we can see your faithfulness in our lives. And thank you that you sent your son Jesus that you could keep your promise to bring us into right relationship with you and to forgive all of our sin. 
We're sorry for times when we have neglected to remember what you have done, when we've not gone to you for strength. We're sorry for the times when we've not reflected you and when we've broken our promises to you and to others. So please fill us afresh with your spirit and help us to keep your laws and to observe how you would have us live. Help us to love others and to love you and to remember your goodness. We pray it for Jesus' glory. Amen.